Uh, these places mean as much to us as anybody on earth, and uh, we're glad to share the passion that we have in the places that we know so well with you. Um, how many of you were with us this afternoon at the first day? A goodly number of you. How many of you are from outside the boundaries of Virginia? Wow, still a high percentage. And I'll ask the same question I asked earlier. How many of you are descendants of participants in the Battle of Chances? Oh, yeah. There you go. How many of you are Union descendants? Will you admit it? <laughs> and how many of you Confederate descendants? Goodly number. Well, welcome especially uh, to all of you. And, and uh, as I said earlier today, the presence of the descendants of the participants here uh, we discovered during our Fredericksburg observance was particularly meaningful to everybody else here. So I think on behalf of everyone here, uh, we welcome those of you whose families have a direct connection uh, to this event. We're here tonight on this beautiful night. We're very lucky this week. We have been blessed with perfect weather for the next several days. Uh, nicer weather than existed in 1863. It was a good deal warmer. In fact, tomorrow was uh, in the mid-80s with a very heavy wind uh, on May 2nd, 1862, but of course Stonewall Jackson and his Confederates were deep in the woods and probably didn't much notice the winds. And the story tonight that we're going to tell at this place on this corner is the story of how those men of Jackson ended up in the woods, marching through the woods here in Chancellorsville on May 2nd, 1863. On this corner, 150 years ago tonight, in a meeting that sputtered on and sputtered off for hours in the darkness, gathered round the campfire, part of the time sitting on cracker boxes, with their swords lit, lit, leaning against trees, paraphernalia on the ground, Lee and Jackson decided to risk everything for the Confederacy here on this field. It was a military calculation to be sure, and we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. The military calculus that Lee and Jackson applied to this moment and the decision to take this immense risk. But the roots of the decision here on this corner 150 years ago tonight uh, are much deeper than mere military calculus. Think of the spring of 1863, and think of the Confederacy, and think of what you might remember even from your school books when you were a child. The Confederate tide is rising. It will rise and rise to a high water mark where? In Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863. We have at this distance, some of us, a vision of a Confederate juggernaut at work. Lee, extremely successful at Fredericksburg and on the peninsula and at 2nd Manassas in 1862. And so it seemed, if you confined your vision to Virginia, to Fredericksburg and Manassas and Richmond, if you confined your view to those places, it seemed true that in 1863 the Confederacy was riding an upward tide. Much of the world believed this, because when the world wanted to know how the war was going, they looked where? To Virginia. It was then the most covered part of the war, and it still is today. And they looked specifically, not just to Virginia, but to Lee's Army of Northern Virginia which trod these fields. And in the spring of 1863, in that narrow view, the war seemed to be going nice for the Confederate States of America, and very badly for the Union. But Robert E. Lee did not have his perceptions of war shaped by the popular press. He, Jefferson Davis, and other Confederate leaders knew better than to see the war purely in terms of the success and the potential of Lee's army. And it was the problems that beset Lee and the Confederacy. 
not the successes that had graced them that helped shape what happened here on this corner, on that night, at Chancellorsville. Let's go back a little bit. In January 1863, a Richmond newspaper printed a schedule showing that the weekly cost to feed a family and the Confederacy had risen from $6.55 in 1860 to $68.25 in three years. By March 1863, flour was selling for $100 a barrel. Beef was $2 a pound, $2 a pound. Apples were $25 a bushel. Boots cost $50 a pair. And wood was $30 a cord. In response to this economic struggle, the Confederate government enacted a number of laws, the type of laws we don't associate with a nation that proclaimed itself in favor of states' rights. In March of 1863, the Confederate Congress passed an impressment law that required all goods going to market to be made available to the government first for the use of the army. And the government would set the price. And so what happened? Farmers stopped sending goods to market because they felt they could not get a fair price. On April 2nd, 1863, the women of Richmond, and also of Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, Atlanta, and Macon, the women in these cities took to the streets. Blood or bread was their cry. They broke open buildings. They rioted in the streets of Richmond for food, for better prices, for the ability to feed their families. And on April 3rd, 1863, the Confederate authorities in Richmond placed cannon in the streets, not to repel Yankee invaders, but to control a restless population. In April, the Confederate government passed a law requiring that all farmers, all producers, will give 10% of their production to the Confederate government, a tax in kind, to give you a sense of how the war weighed here in Spotsylvania County. Spotsylvania simply wrote a letter to Richmond and said, we cannot do it. We do not have the food available here to feed our own people. Slavery in Northern Virginia and Central Virginia was largely destroyed. Two-thirds of slaves by 1864 had left their workplaces in Virginia, proving absolutely Lincoln's assertion that slavery had everything to do with sustaining the Confederate war effort. And the abolition of slavery would diminish the Confederates' ability to wage war. Elsewhere, armies loomed. Union armies loomed across the South. In Middle Tennessee, a massive army stood prepared to advance nearly to Georgia. And most dire, on April 30th, 1863, the day before Lee and Jackson met on this corner, on April 30th, Ulysses S. Grant's army crossed the Mississippi River into Mississippi, south of Vicksburg, commencing the final chapter of the campaign that would end with the closure, the splitting of the Confederates along the Mississippi River. So what does all this have to do with Robert E. Lee and this corner around that fire on May 2nd, 1863? Well, in the Army itself, rations had been reduced to four ounces of bacon a day and 18 ounces of flour a day with and I quote, a semi-occasional issuing of rice, sugar, and molasses. Not sure how something can be semi-occasional, but it's a creative use of words. And also here at Chancellorsville, Lee had only two-thirds of his army. One-third of that army, about 20,000 men under James Longstreet, was about 140 miles away from here in southeastern Virginia. In Suffolk, Virginia. Now they were there for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that they were there was because it was an area of Virginia that had been unplundered 
where the army could forage and gain supplies. And so those bread riots in Richmond and Mobile and the restlessness among the southern people and the unwillingness or the difficulty that farmers had in fulfilling the taxes and impressments required by the Confederate government affected directly Lee's army here on this corner on that night 150 years ago. Now the dreary gloom that hung over the Confederacy that spring, everywhere except the glow that surrounded Lee's army, that dreary gloom focused only more attention on Robert E. Lee. He, by May of 1863, stood as the Confederacy's great beacon of hope. Success was coming nowhere else, and the promise of success only seemed to ride with Robert E. Lee. One man wrote of Lee after this battle. He said, distance does not lend enchantment to the old fellow's greatness, I assure you. The nearer he comes, the higher he looms up. It is plain, simple, unaffected greatness. It is just as natural and easy for him to be great as it is for me to be ordinary. And there is probably less affectation about it. Robert E. Lee knew that victories at his hand would give hope to a struggling people. He hoped defeats inflicted by him on Union armies would challenge the will and ability of the North to continue this war. Now we often hear, it's a common complaint or criticism of Lee, that he was not strategic in his thinking, that he thought very narrowly in military form or about military matters. But in fact, Robert E. Lee, probably better than anyone in the Confederacy, understood the political implications of what he and his army did. From the time that he took command in 1862, through 2nd Manassas, through the invasion of Maryland, through the victory at Fredericksburg, and to this corner on that night 150 years ago. Everything Robert E. Lee did, he did with an eye toward diminishing the will, the ability of the Northern people to continue to resist Southern independence. He knew that not only was his army the great beacon for the South, that it was the great fear for the North, and that his successes would be multiplied many times because where they happened and how many people were watching them so carefully. He wrote in 1863, we should reject no honorable means of dividing and weakening our enemies so that they may feel some of the same difficulties we have experienced. It seems to me the most effective way to accomplish this object is to give all the encouragement we can to the rising peace party in the North. There's a military leader acutely aware of the political potential that his victories held. He recognized that for the North, victory in this war required total victory, the vanquishing of Southern armies. But he also knew that for the South, Victory required only the decision by the North to allow the South to go. And so everything that Lee did was calculated toward that end. With that in mind, he came to Brett Chancellorsville on May 1st, 1863, in command of a diminished army, yet still willing to take immense risks. He was the beacon of the the man who sat around the campfire on this corner on that night 150 years ago was a complicated man serving a complicated cause. He fought to dismember a nation and to create a new one. He fought for a government intent on sustaining slavery. But he also exhibited characteristics as a leader that all of us who aspire to lead might well be advised 
to abide and even emulate. There are a number of characteristics that Lee had, that if you're a manager, if you lead people, uh, he is worth watching. He was little affected by criticism. Paid little attention to outside criticism. Most of us are not so strong as to do that. He would write in 1862, he said, we made a great mistake in the beginning of our struggles. We appointed all our worst generals to command our armies and all our best generals to edit our newspapers. <laughs> Another mainspring of Lee's success, he was diligent about getting along with his boss. You will not succeed, or rarely will succeed, if you don't get along with your boss. George McClellan could not get along with his boss. Braxton Bragg could not get along with his boss. But Lee was assiduous about getting along with Jefferson Davis. Robert E. Lee, in sharp contrast to many of the men that he met on these battlefields, always focused on what he might do to the other guy. And he spent very little time worrying about what the other guy would do to him. McClellan, of course, was just the opposite worried entirely about what the other guy would do to him. And Hooker, on May 1st, 1863, transformed from a man intent on inflicting harm. That's not part of it. <laughs> but Hooker became in, transformed from a man intent on inflicting harm to a man intent on fighting defensively, on ensuring that Lee could do nothing to him. One man said of Lee, he fights so fast when he gets the enemy where he wants them that they never recover from the first. And at Chancellorsville, Robert E. Lee would fight fast. But there was one more thing about Lee that I want to share with you as we ponder this scene on this corner on this night. It's another characteristic of successful people, and that is that he possessed the courage to act. When he sat around this fire, as Frank and Greg will describe to you in just a second, when he sat around this fire, he knew very little about the Union Army and where it was. He had glimpses and snippets, and yet he had to fill in the blank. He had to be able to conceive in his mind's eye where the Union Army was and what it intended to do, and more importantly, what he could do to it. And then, amidst all the uncertainty, he had to have the courage to act. Joseph Hooker, his opponent here at Chancellorsville, was a man who demonstrated that the greatest inspire inspiration for conservatism is responsibility. When you are responsible, most people become more conservative. When someone else is responsible, much easier to be bold. But Lee never yielded to his willingness to be aggressive. As bold as Jackson was, Lee was bolder still. Now Frank might jump in here and contradict me on this. But remember this, Lee was juggling the fate of his nation. There was no safety net for Robert E. Lee. If you have a boss though, you have a safety net. And Lee in the field had no bosses. Robert E. Lee, though humble, sometimes shy, was a supremely confident man. Now around this fire, on this night, 150 years ago, with Lee, was Thomas Jonathan Jackson. We'll be talking of Jackson, con Jackson constantly over the next couple of days. But for tonight, think of this. Think of his great successes in this war up to this point. The Shenandoah Valley Campaign. Second Manassas. They were not born of battlefield prowess. They were born of daring and determination. For Lee, Jackson was like a point guard on a basketball team. 
when there was no opening, when there was no opportunity, he turned to Jackson to create opportunity. Here at Chancellorsville, Lee was confronted with an army nearly on this field here, nearly twice the size of his own, led by a man, Hooker, who had come uncomfortably close to fooling Lee on April 29th and 30th, 1863. But now, that army was holed up in earthworks less than a half a mile from where we are. Strong earthworks, with little opportunity to attack. Lee needed an opportunity. And so the question hovered over this fire on this corner that night 150 years ago. Could Lee and, Lee and Jackson get at those people? as Lee said. Could this man, Lee, with his world-famous subordinate, great as they may have been, move the needle in favor of Confederate independence? Would the risk that Lee's own personality and his nascent nation <coughs> required of him, would they be justified by the results of the decision made on this corner? on this night 150 years ago. The world would soon see as Lee undertook perhaps his greatest gamble conceived here around the fire. One hundred and fifty years ago tonight this moment, the weather around you is almost precisely what they experienced down to the temperature. Weather observers noted that the temperature in Northern Virginia this day in 1863 started at 7 a.m. at 52 degrees. This morning we were 54 degrees. The temperature climbed to 74 degrees by 2 p.m. here on the Chancellorsville battlefield. Today, according to the thermometer, at least in my car, it was 75 degrees. And then it cooled down to about 63 degrees at 9 p.m. This moment, a century and a half ago, the first chapter of the Battle of Chancellorsville had slipped into a fitful, sporadic silence. The only thing that could be heard around us, besides the low murmur of troops north and south, were whippoorwills who haunted these forests with their cries. The Union Army of the Potomac, the army of Major General Joseph Hooker, had surrendered the initiative this day, May 1st, and sometime during the day started to withdraw back into a tight defensive cordon at Chancellorsville. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia took post right here where we are, just one mile from Chancellorsville, and as you heard, a half mile from the federal defenses. This evening, this moment, Union commanders gathered at Chancellorsville and met with General Joseph Hooker. They grumbled and groused about Hooker surrendering the initiative, his decision to remain on the defense. They were incredulous when that commander said that they had Lee exactly where they wanted him. Union commanders like the 5th Corps Commander General George Gordon Meade, noted for his acerbic temper, was seen dancing in the yard at Chancellorsville 24 hours ago, saying hurrah for old Joe. But by this evening, he had returned back to his more mercurial fits, grumbling that how does Hooker expect to defend the bottom of a hill when he cannot defend the top of a hill? The commander of the 12th Corps, Henry Slocum, rather quiet and demure for the most part, took it even harder than me. The messenger that brought him the orders to retreat from this very spot and fall back to Chancellorsville to the north were met with anger. In fact, he arrested the messenger and threatened to court-martial him if he found that this was little short than treason. 
treason is punishable with death. But when he had found out from Hooker himself that the order was valid and stood, he unceremoniously released his prisoner, much to the delight of many people in the North, because Washington Roebling would go on to an illustrious career with suspension bridges, particularly with Brooklyn, but his career could have easily ended right here. And the person who took it worst of all was the second in command of the entire Union Army. Major General Darius Nash Couch walked away from a meeting this evening and had perhaps one of the most damning statements ever written when he said to hear it from his own lips was almost too much to bear, that all the hard work and hard marching of his troops were going to culminate in a defensive battle in this nest of thickets was unbelievable. And I left my commanding officer with the distinct impression that he was a whipped man. <clears throat> Meanwhile, at this hour, Lieutenant General Thomas Jonathan Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, had managed the Battle of Chancellorsville so far for the Confederates. He had tried throughout the day to bait and trap a sizable portion of the Union Army. But then the Federals fell back to Chancellorsville rather precipitously before he could launch his trap. He sought opportunities to turn them out of Chancellorsville and out of their defenses, reconnoitering to the west of us towards Catherine Furness, towards Hazel Grove. He was joined by the Confederate Cavalry Chief, Jeb Stewart, and both of them came under shell fire this evening and narrowly avoided death. Thwarted in his efforts to turn Chancellorsville, Stonewall Jackson started moving back towards the east, heading back towards this spot, all the time looking for an opportunity, a weakness that he could exploit, something that he could strike at and make a decisive blow. General Robert E. Lee had not been here. He had spent the better part of the day in Fredericksburg, lingering behind, satisfying himself that the federal troops in the town and in the floodplain below were, mere, no, uh, were merely a faint or no immediate threat. Lee had already divided his army he had left 10,000 Confederates under General Jubal Anderson Earl to mine the heights outside Fredericksburg, while the rest of the forces under Stonewall Jackson and the vestiges of James Longstreet's Corps and the divisions of Richard Heron Anderson and Lafayette McLaws came out here to confront an indeterminate Federal force concentrating in the woods of the wilderness. Lee rode out from Fredericksburg on the afternoon of May 1st, and he followed in the aftermath of Stonewall Jackson's surprisingly quick advance to this place. Lee reconnoitered to the north of us, towards the Rappahannock River, aiming to turn Hooker's left flank. But what he found is that his opponent had picked his ground well. It was high ground, it was well fortified. It had woods and watersheds and swamps all across its front. In short, it was unassailable ground. Finding no openings, Robert E. Lee started moving his way to the southwest, also heading towards this intersection, also looking for opportunities. Stonewall Jackson was the first one to arrive on this spot. <clears throat> he conversed briefly with his lieutenants, a major general named Ambrose Powell Hill, A.P. Hill, and Richard Heron Anderson of South Carolina. Jackson asked Hill to go find him guides to familiarize him with the surrounding area. Hill's division had a number of Virginia units, including locals from the 40th and 47th Virginia, that should be able to shed light on the almost impermeable darkness of the wilderness. Shortly after those generals departed, Robert E. Lee arrived here on this scene, just shortly before sunset. As the generals met literally in the intersection, their timing was bad. 
for a Confederate artillery unit had just pulled into park in the road, and a Union sharpshooter found this a very tempting target and started to pepper the intersection with fire. The artillery moved, the staff officers scattered, and the two generals stepped off to the side of the road and under the cover of the trees dismounted. Once everything had left the intersection, the tempting target removed, the Union sharpshooter moved off and looked for other opportunities without realizing that he had two of the greatest Confederate generals right there in his sights. When Lee dismounted at this point, he took a seat on a log and asked Stonewall Jackson to sit beside him. And they talked over the day's events and tried to assess their situation. The great tandem of this amazing war that we study, the living embodiment of the ideal synergy of thought, discipline, dedication, and above all, action, didn't exactly start their greatest collaboration here in the best of circumstances. In truth, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson didn't see eye to eye at Chancellorsville at all this evening, 150 years ago. Stonewall Jackson was of the opinion that the federal forces around Chancellorsville were a mere diversion. They were not here to fight. They were a fate or a failure. But it was impossible to bait them into battle. It was impossible to trap them with combat. And they had backed off too easily, too quickly, too soon. By tomorrow morning, Stonewall Jackson proclaimed, there will not be any of them this side of the river. Lee was of a different opinion. The bulk of the Union Army was marshaled directly in front of this position. General Hooker had invested too much effort, too much time, and too many men and material to walk away. This was his main effort. And while the two great generals differed in their opinions, Lee was the tactful one who suggested that they should make a contingency just in case the Union Army decided to stay and fight. They compared notes on what they had experienced and what they had seen over the day. Lee could find no soft spot to attack off to the right. Jackson could find no soft spot to attack off to the left. They sent their engineers off to do a reconnaissance of the Union Center directly towards Chancellorsville, a mile in front of you. Major TMR Talcott of Lee's staff went off with Captain James Keith Boswell of Stonewall Jackson's staff. Boswell, known to the staff officers affectionately as preserves, because he had a great affinity for eating jams and not sharing them with the others. When these men left, the generals were left to ponder what limited options were left to them. And as they were stymied by their situation, good news arrived. Major General Jeb Stewart of the cavalry showed up on the seat, happy to tell them the Confederate cavalry had been ranging out to the west, further afield than even Stonewall Jackson and Stewart himself had gone. And Robert E. Lee's nephew, Fitzhugh Lee, had discovered the Union right flank, quote, up in the air. What up in the air means specifically is that while most of the Union forces were fortifying their positions, strengthening their lines, the Union 11th Corps of Major General Oliver Otis Howard were off to the west of us, merely pulling off the side of the road and camping. They had no defenses, natural or man-made. And that was the weak link that the generals had been searching for, looking for. It is one thing for cavalry to range out there and find it, but it is an entirely different matter to find a way for an army to march there and strike it. Despite the fact that the Confederates have been here since November of 1862, nobody was truly familiar with the ground and the roads of the wilderness. Most of the Confederates had to focus their attention on the Orange Turnpike, modern day Route 3, and everything north of it towards the Rappahannock. But very little attention was paid to those roads south of the Turnpike, the area where we are. The Union High Command was ignorant 
of the wilderness, but so were the Confederates on this evening of May 1st. So Jeb Stewart left this place very quickly to go look and locate a suitable network of roads to get an army around Chancellorsville. He also set out to recruit guides of his own to familiarize him with this area as fast as possible. Staff officers also dashed about, each with assignments. Others gathered around the generals by their campfire, somewhat like satellites moving around their generals, eavesdropping, trying to gain some kernel of truth or understanding or knowledge of what was transpiring. One of the staff officers appeared to have become so engrossed, he literally crowded up against Robert E. Lee. And his name was Lieutenant James Power Smith. In the midst of conversation, Lee abruptly broke off and addressed Jackson's staff officer with a direct order, saying, Mr. Smith, we are plagued by a masked battery of the enemy, and I desire you to find its location for me. Smith grabbed a guide and dutifully bounded off into the woods, searching for Union artillery somewhere off to your left front. And he would be gone for hours. Sometime before midnight, the engineers returned, Talcott and Preserves Boswell could report that the center of the Union line was fortified and improving by the hour, so that it was completely unassailable. The Federal left and the center were untouchable, and everything now hung on finding a way to get to the Union right flank, to get to the west. At one point, Robert E. Lee paced back and forth before this spot, threw his hand absently towards Chancellorsville and muttered, how can we get at those people? And Jackson quietly, demurely said, you know best. In essence, it was for you to say. In truth, Jackson still didn't believe they would be there come morning, that under cover of darkness, they would escape. And the main thrust would have to come from some other direction. Lee became very sensitive to his lieutenant and abruptly, on the spot, volunteered to run several cannon out in front of the lines by Catherine Furness and shell the Federal positions before dawn. If the Federals were there, they would respond. The only purpose of this exercise was to sell Stonewall Jackson. Jackson was sensible to that, thanked Lee, and then went to bed. In truth, those guns did go out before dawn. They did open fire on the Federals, and the Federals did respond. And it's at that point that Jackson was on the same page with Robert E. Lee, and they were going to have to act because the Union Army had stayed to fight. As Jackson tried to find a place to sleep in these woods, somewhere near this intersection, the two great generals had outstripped their wagon trains this day. They didn't have any camp equipment. There were no tents, there were no cots. So these generals had to improvise like all the soldiers of the wilderness that night. They slept on the ground and they used their saddle blankets as beds and their saddles as pillows. They tried to find warmth in their overcoats. Jackson's de facto chief of staff, Alexander Swift Pendleton, better known to his family and friends as Sandy Pendleton, had a great coat, a winter overcoat, which he volunteered to give to Jackson, and the general declined. At that point, Pendleton detached the large cape on the coat and offered that to Jackson, who gratefully accepted the cape and left his staff officer to sleep in the big coat. Shortly after that, Lee also went to bed, sleeping under one of the trees, resting his head on his saddle, wrapping himself in his overcoat. A little after midnight, Lieutenant James Power Smith returned from searching for masked batteries. He had been sent out on the direct order of Robert E. Lee, and he had to report to Lee. He had to wake Lee up to tell him that he could not find those guns. Lee chided the young man and said that the young men of Smith's day were just not equal to the young men of his day. <laughs> 
if they would have found those guns. And as Smith drew up in feigned hurt, Lee reached out, grabbed him by the shoulder, and brought him in very close to his face. And there, face to face in the darkness, Lee chuckled just to let him know he had been set up. In and of itself, it seems like a small and almost irrelevant event. But at the same time, I think it's an extremely revealing event. As we think about the state of the morale of these two armies and their commanders. On the evening of May 1st, the Union Army outnumbers the Confederates almost two and a half to one. They have the commanding ground. They have fortified positions. They have all the logistics and all the supplies they can need, and they command all of the roads around Chancellorsville. They command all the approaches to Chancellorsville. They have every advantage. And yet, what was the morale at Chancellorsville that night? It was wretched. And the commanders were in open disbelief of Joseph Hooker. Out here in the woods, far removed from the opulence of the Chancellorsville Tavern, where generals don't even have tents. They don't have a plan. They have no means of getting around the Union Army. And yet, the state of morale here has the generals joking. There is a tremendous optimism in this headquarters, and that optimism would pay off. <coughs> Jackson got about two hours of sleep before he was up. He placed the cloak he had borrowed from Sandy Pendleton over the sleeping staff officer, and then went to a nearby fire for warmth. He drew up a cracker box and sat by that fire. Shortly afterwards, Jackson's chaplain, a man named Beverly Tucker Lacey, was seen to emerge out of the darkness, and Jackson asked him to sit down with him. I wish to talk to you, he said. Jackson was a deacon in the Presbyterian faith and found Beverly Tucker Lacey an extremely refreshing kindred spirit. But he didn't seek ecclesiastical studies this evening. He wanted it for a very secular purpose. Reverend Lacey had preached in these woods prior to the war. He knew this area, he knew these roads, and he knew the people. Jackson wanted to know is there a way for the Confederates to get around the Union Army? And Reverend Lacey said there was. This very road that you are sitting on tonight leads off to the west and goes to Catherine's Furnace. And then it deviates south and meets with the Brock Road. And the Brock Road led directly north towards the Union flank. It was ideal, except Jackson didn't quite conceptualize it, and he asked the man to draw it for him. As they drew this map together, Jackson was dissatisfied. He didn't like it. He was critical. It was too close to the Union lines. In fact, he came perilously close to what Jackson assumed would be their picket line, guarding all the logical approaches. He wanted something further away, something better, something undercover. Reverend Lacey didn't know what that road might be, but he knew people in the wilderness who might be able to answer that question. He recommended that they should go talk to Charles C. Welford, who was living just below the Catherine Furnace, and whose home this very evening was the headquarters of Jeb Stewart. Jackson ordered his ubiquitous map maker, Jedediah Hotchkiss, awaken and told to go with Reverend Lacey to talk to Mr. Welford. As they went off into the darkness, Jackson sat by the fire. The next person who woke up at this point was one of Lee's staff officers, a colonel named Armistead L. Long. And as he looked over, the first thing that caught his eye was Jackson, who was shivering from the chill of the morning, hovering over the fires, literally thrusting his fingers into the flames to absorb some of the heat. Long joined him and then moved off to another campfire to beg a cup of coffee for the general and conveniently for himself as well. As he came back to join Jackson for this cup of coffee, they stood by the fire and at that moment, Jackson's sword, which had been leaning against one of the trees, 
abruptly fell over with a clatter. Armistead Long picked up this sword, handed it to Jackson, who strapped it on at that point. Perhaps it was an afterthought, perhaps it was history, but later on, Long claimed that he had a nagging feeling of foreboding or ill omen with that sword. Of course, that's hindsight. They didn't have much time to think about such things, because almost moments after that, Robert E. Lee was awakened, and he came to join Jackson by the fire. He pulled up a cracker box as well. Cracker boxes that had been provided to them by the Union Army's 12th Corps, who had left them in their hasty retreat on the evening of May 1st. As the general sat there, Jedediah Hotchkiss returned from his interview with Charles Welford, and he stuck a cracker box between the other two and put a map out for them to look at what he had found. There was, indeed, a way to get around the Union Army. Reverend Lacey was correct. They should take this road down to Catherine's Furnace and on to the Brock Road. But at Brock Road, instead of turning north and showing themselves to the Federal observers, they would deviate south about 600 yards and then double back on a tiny western track beyond Brock Road, a road that didn't appear on anyone's map because it wasn't a road at all. It was a simple farm lane that attached the Trigg family farm to the Stevens family farm. It was never designed for through traffic, but a quick look at it proved that 27,000 men on the march could easily handle it. As soon as he said that, there was a moment of silence by that fire, and then Lee asked three penetrating questions. He asked Jackson, what do you propose to do? Jackson pointed out exactly Hotchkiss's route and answered simply, go around here. <clears throat> Lee asked, what do you propose to make this movement with? And Jackson didn't hesitate. He answered, my entire core. Since James Longstreet was not here, having taken two divisions to Southeast Virginia, that didn't leave much more to the Army except Jackson's Corps. And Lee asked the third question, what will you leave me? And Jackson said, the divisions of Anderson and McLaws, the remains of the Longstreet's Corps. The generals pondered it for a moment as they were thinking, this was a plan. This was a plan where it was all or nothing. This was a big plan, and it required big numbers. And finally, Lee said, well, go on. These were two professional soldiers. Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee were West Point graduates. One of them had become the superintendent of West Point. The other had become a 10-year professor at the Virginia Military Institute. Both of them were seasoned veterans of the war with Mexico, and now two years of fighting in Virginia and Maryland. And in this one moment, in this critical instant, they had taken everything they had ever learned, and everything they had ever taught, and everything they had ever experienced, and they discarded it. Because the first rule of the soldier, the cardinal rule of the soldier, is that in the face of a larger enemy, you must of necessity concentrate your forces. And what Lee and Jackson were proposing to do was divide their forces directly in the face of Hooker's army. They weren't dividing their army into two. They were dividing their army into three. They had left 10,000 Confederates back in Fredericksburg under Jubal Early. And now they were proposing to leave 13,000 Confederates where we are under the direct command of Robert E. Lee to hold the attention of almost 75 to 85,000 Union soldiers in front of them. While 27,000 Confederates followed Stonewall Jackson on a 12-mile flank march around the Union Army. That is audacity. That is staggering audacity. 
It was nearly daylight at this point, and once they had committed themselves, Robert E. Lee instantly pulled out a pencil and started writing the orders. Jackson jumped up and enthusiastically said, my men will move at once, sir. And he and Hotchkiss instantly mounted up and prepared to get this march underway. The time for planning and plotting and preparation for one of the world's greatest military accomplishments had started and ended right here. And after conceiving this plan, now the time had come to implement it, to execute. intersection is well known for two famous incidents. The first incident was just described by Frank. The series of meetings that began 150 years ago tonight at this intersection that extended on into the following morning that we refer to as the Cracker Box Conference. The second famous incident was not a, a long drawn out incident like the Cracker Box Conference. It's a very short conversation, and one which we know actually very little about. That incident was referred to as the last meeting. My assignment for tonight is to pick up the story where Frank left off with Stonewall Jackson at this intersection declaring my troops will move at once, sir, and taking you through the last meeting and a few thoughts after. Frank said, now is the time to execute the plan that was developed here. Both Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee had some specific roles to do in preparing the troops for that action. For Jackson, even though he declared that his troops would move at once, they really couldn't move at once because they were not prepared for it. Jackson is very secretive, as many of you may know, and he had not indicated to his command that they should be preparing for a march on this day. So it was Jackson's role to inform them. He rode back to his troops behind you and instructed them to quickly finish eating their breakfast, to pack up their belongings, and to form up in their marching formations in the road, getting ready to march. This would not be an ordinary march, however. There would be some special rules applied to this one that normally did not apply to Jackson's troops on the march. And some of Jackson's men even got a hint of that before they got the orders. Shortly after Jackson left here and started to ride down the plank road behind you, one of the units under the command of a man named Samuel McGowan, some South Carolinians, spotted Stonewall Jackson. Their initial inclination was to put up a cheer, as is often a habit when troops see a commander that they think very highly of. But as Jackson got closer, they changed their mind, came to the conclusion that cheering may not be a very good idea. As one of the South Carolinians said, as they observed Jackson's face, he had battled in his haste and stern looks. Indeed, there would be some stern aspects of this march because not only were the men ordered to hurry up and finish breakfast and pack and get ready to move, but other special orders. There would be no breaks on this march. It would be, in essence, a forced march. Jackson's normal marching habits was to allow his men to march 50 minutes, and if they covered two miles in that amount of time, they would be allowed to take a 10-minute break. And every hour, 50 minutes of marching, 10 minutes of break. And Jackson's men had a famous nickname. They were known as the Foot Cavalry because of their ability to move, as many felt, uh, almost as quickly as the cavalry could. And I think one of the reasons why Jackson's men were such great marches, marchers is because they had that incentive. Many other commands may have had no idea how long they're going to be marching before they get a break, but Jackson's men knew. You put in 50 minutes of hard marching, you get a break. On this day, however, that was suspended. 
If you don't give men breaks, one of the things that you might expect is there will be a significant number of men to drop out. And Jackson apparently appreciated that too. Another set of special orders, a North Carolina captain said that, quote, regimental commanders were ordered to march in rear of their regiments with a guard of strong men with fixed bayonets to prevent straggling. Men with fixed bayonets ready to prod you in the back if you do not keep up along. Again, stern looks from Jackson on that day. Robert E. Lee had assignments too. He not only was the army commander, but in the absence of James Longstreet, as Frank mentioned, the two divisions left behind, those of Anderson and McClaws, fell under Jackson. I'm just saying, fell under Robert E. Lee. Lee is an army commander and a corps commander as well. So Lee is communicating with his officers, explaining their important roles, and there are basically two things that Lee stressed that they needed to do. One was to build earthworks. Frank pointed out that these 13,000 men left behind Lee confronted upwards of 70,000 Union soldiers in front of them. The only thing standing between the Union Army and the Confederate capital behind you is these 13,000 men. And in case the Union Army did the prudent thing and realized that and tried to attack, it would be necessary for these 13,000 men to fight from chest high defensive works. So put the men to work digging trenches. The other thing that Robert E. Lee wanted his men to do is prepare for skirmishing, sending out a thin battle line ahead of you against the Union Army. Now normally when we hear of skirmishing, we think of it as being something rather insignificant and unimportant. Um, light fighting that is basically done simply to annoy the enemy. That couldn't be further from the case on this particular evening. Lee's men had an important role in skirmishing. So in order to make sure that the Union Army was under the false impression that the entire Confederate Army was still here in this location and not marching off with Jackson, it was important to have the skirmish line heavily engaged and be very active with the enemy. Make the enemy think that this is some kind of a probing action and that if the Confederates find a weakness, that there's a battle line behind it ready to exploit it. But the real purpose of the heavy skirmishing is as a diversion to detract attention from the Union Army away from whatever they might spot of Jackson and to focus on what was happening right here. Both Generals Jackson and Lee completed their assignments that morning somewhere between 7 and 7.30 in the morning because at that moment the head of Jackson's column would appear at this point. Marching on the road behind you and to your right, coming up to this intersection, turning to the left, marching down the road where you are all seated, the head of Jackson's column. And a short distance into the column Stonewall Jackson and his staff. And again, Robert E. Lee had returned to, from his mission of speaking with Anderson McClaws, returned here to this intersection that would be his command post, standing somewhere along the side of the road. Stonewall Jackson saw Robert E. Lee standing along the road, veered away from his staff, and they had a conversation here. Observers describe to us what Lee and Jackson did during this gathering, but they were unable to tell us what they said. What they observed them doing is, first of all, Jackson apparently doing most of the talking. Robert E. Lee predominantly would nod his head, either nodding that he understood what Jackson had said or giving his approval of what Jackson may have wanted to do. This conversation came to a close with Jackson making a grand gesture pointing out to the west in the direction in which his men were marching and then he rode away off in that same direction in which he had just pointed. Now we don't, again, we don't know what happened in this conversation. It doesn't help us, the story, to better understand Lee. It doesn't help us to better understand Jackson. 
doesn't help us to better understand the battle of Chancellorsville. In many respects, it's an insignificant action, little gathering that occurred right here. But it is important to mention because of one very significant factor. That last meeting was the final time that these two great generals ever spoke to one another. It was the last meeting between Robert Edward Lee and Thomas Jonathan Jackson. Now these two commanders would communicate again in the last, in the eight days following the last meeting, but it was always either through writing or through verbal messages that are being relayed. I'd like to share with you some of the messages that came right after this. One of the significant messages that uh, was, was sent out was on the morning of May 3rd. And by that moment, Stonewall Jackson had already been wounded. He'd already suffered the amputation of his left arm. Jackson, sometime early on the morning of May 3rd, sent a message to Robert E. Lee. We don't have the message, but we do have Lee's response. Lee wrote this, and it was read to Jackson by the staff officer, James Power Smith. General, I have just received your note informing me that you were wounded. I cannot express my regret at the occurrence. Could I have directed events? I should have chosen for the good of the country to have been disabled in your stead. I congratulate you upon the victory, which is due to your skill and energy. After hearing that message, Stonewall Jackson turned away from James Power Smith that read that to him and replied in a low tone, General Lee is very kind, but he should give the praise to God. And probably the most famous message between Lee and Jackson held over the next eight days following the last meeting occurred on May 6th. Robert E. Lee on that occasion was speaking with Stonewall Jackson's chaplain, Beverly Tucker Lacey, a man that had had congregations in the area and brought to this very intersection information about some of the nearby roads. At that point on May 6th, Stonewall Jackson had already left this area and been taken down to Guinea Station, a rail junction from whence he would hopefully be evacuated to Richmond 